All right, back to Bergson and the holographic theory of mind. And this will be part 29, quantum computing and the brain. So we'll be looking at quantum mechanics, its conceptual core is related to quantum computing, how quantum computers work, Shor's algorithm, which is perhaps the epitome of a quantum algorithm, Scott Aronson's assessment, Aronson being the computer scientist, expert on quantum mechanics, quantum AI, quantum computing, and conceptual limits, for example, the NP-complete class as far as computational complexity, back to Penrose, also or or and the fundamental question, does this change anything with respect to Bergson and the model of the brain implied? Over the series, I've tried to explicate Bergson's model of the brain. That is, the brain is supporting a concrete reconstructive wave passing through the holographic external field and thereby specific to events now being an image within the field right where they, the events, say they are in the field externally to us. That is, what's termed direct perception. And the models contrast to the computer slash AI slash Turing machine model of mind. Of course, there is a gorilla in the room. That is the quantum computer. Does this piece change anything? Is it immune to the critique of the AI computer model? Does it obviate the need for Bergson's vision? This is the quest of part 29 here. So the great plan, we'll try to demystify quantum computing. The truth is this is kind of difficult. We'll look briefly at standard computing and how the quantum computer, I'm, I'm gonna abbreviate this as Q computer because too long to write out quantum computer all the time. So how the Q computer can be a standard computer. So we'll get a basis. Then the question is how is a quantum computer more powerful? We'll try to piece together some intuitive insights on this. We're looking at the core of quantum mechanics, choice fact factoring algorithm, and what are the theor theoretical limits, the NP-complete problem, classic complexity problems, and the nature of computation. Again, does anything change with the brain consciousness perception? So there are two components in what we'll call this old computing framework. So yesterday, information and information processing. So what is information? Well, basically ones and zeros. Could be called true and false, or cats and dogs. The point being, information in its most basic form can be represented as a series of bits, as such, zeros and ones. Where each bit can be in one of two different states, zero, zero or one. But let's stop already for a moment before we get drawn head first into this matrix. Note, is this really information? Well, if you're Gibson or Bergson, no, it is not invariance. This is information as far as the brain is concerned. That is my standard model, coffee stirring, with its velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors, acoustical invariance, texture gradients, ratios, flows, in other words, the invariance structure. But these invariants exist only over time, over a time extension, over a flow. They cannot exist in a static instant or as a bit that can be transmitted along wires or nerves. This is only true in the computer metaphor, that is, in the classic metaphysic, which sees time as a series of instants. And the instants in limit are static. That is, there's no change within an instant. Therefore, there can be, since there is no change, a static or determinate value. But in constant flow, there's constant change. There can be no determinate value. And the brain dwells in a field that is constantly transforming continuously in which there can be no 
determinant value. So information to it must be invariance over flows. Only the classic metaphysic allows this zero one static bit notion. So just a warning before we go on that there is another view, profoundly different view of what information might actually be. So back to bits, numbers can be bits. We lay out a series or a pattern of ones and zeros. For example, the first seven numbers, we only need three bits, zero being zero, zero, all the way to seven, which is a one, one, one. And when we get to eight, now we need another bit. We need four bits, and this continues right on. Letters can be represented as bits, as ASCII code, it is an agreed upon standard. And A, for example, is 65, which is now a, a bit pattern. Or an X is 88, which is, again, another one of those bit patterns. And we can have images as bits, again, with agreed upon standard, JPEG or BMP. Where bits are in a computer? Well, in the hard drive, there's mag magnetization bits. And a change in magnetization implies either a one state or a zero state, or a change of voltage. Five volts could be a one, zero volt, volts could be zero. So now the processing. All this can be broken down into Boolean logic gates. There are seven gates, shown in the picture to the right there, and we'll talk about them quickly. They take in one or two bits, and spit out a new one. Easiest to talk in this context of true and false as opposed to one and zero. So first we have the not gate. It takes a bit in and spits out what the bit is not. So if it takes in a true, it spits out a false. If a false, it spits out a true. Then there's the AND gate. It only spits out a true if it gets two trues, it spits out a false otherwise. For example, you've got the sun hot and the sky blue, both are true statements, so we'll spit out a true, but the sun's hot and the sky's pink, both are not true, one is false, and so we're going to spit out a false. So there's the pattern for the AND gate, all false is only true if both are true. Then there's the OR gate. It only spits out a false if it receives two falses and a true otherwise. So again, the sun can be hot and the sky blue. That's both correct, so it's true. Uh, or it likes the fact that sun and hot sky is pink. At least one is true, so it'll, it'll still kick out true. But if both, both are false, sun cold, sky pink, well, it gets a false. And then there's the exclusive or, it's just a different kind of or, and it's true. If it's, it's true, you can get a side of fries or a side of salad, but not both. In other words, it spits out a true if one or the other is true, but not both. And the last three gates are just inverses of the above. You have a NAND gate that literally spits out not what the AND gate puts out, so instead of putting out a T, where both are Ts, and Fs otherwise, it spits out an F when given two Ts and Ts otherwise. And then you have the not or the nor. It spits out exactly not what the or gate spits out. And then the XNOR spits out exactly not what the XOR gate spits out. So we can assemble all these gates, like in the nice picture below, and one can add, say, any three-digit number. So we have in this little diagram a two coming in and a seven coming in. We can consider those digits in their bit patterns, the zero one zero being the two and the one 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 being the seven placed in registers. And then the operation that's requested is an addition. And loaded, loaded in the two registers, the operation applied we run through the gates, and out comes the number nine. So we've accomplished an addition. 
What are the gates? Well, traditionally they're transistors like a switch. So you have an NMOS transistor. It lets current through and a voltage is applied. So we apply a, a voltage to the NMOS and the current now goes through the, the gap there. A PMOS stops the current when the voltage is applied. So we apply the voltage and the circuit is open. No more electronic elect, electrical flow. With these little transistors or switches, you can build all the gates, an AND gate, an OR gate, etc. So that's the fundamentals of good old, old computing. Let's move to quantum computing. At this point, in many short presentations, it's standard to now describe, in my experience, qubits, quantum gates, and then kind of stop. That is, we never quite get a picture of why the quantum com computer can do the marvels it is supposedly able to do. So we'll do qubits and gates too, but we're gonna backtrack a bit later to get a better picture. Qubits take the place of the ones and zeros. Sometimes a property called spin is used. An electron in spin up is a one, spin down is a zero. Or the polarization of a photon. Polarized vertically, it's a one. Horizontally, it's a zero. Or it can be something in between, as we'll soon see. So in a quantum system, you can have one or zero like before, but you can also have a superposition, either in one or zero, but in between, like a coin that is neither heads nor tails, but in between. That is in many possible different values. As you can visualize the angled vector there on the right, pointing at many different places along the curve. It is many different values. So these qubits can do more than classical bits, but there's a catch. Though they can be in many more states, when they're measured, they lose this superposition state. It collapses to, again, either a zero or a one. Because measurement actually changes the qubit, measurement is considered a quantum gate. The gate takes in a qubit, which can be in any state, and spits out a qubit, which is either one or zero. But the spitting out is not random. The probability of a one or zero is related to the state the qubit's already in. So in the bottom picture there, we have a qubit that's in a probability of 75% of being in a one and a 25% of being in a zero state. So the measurement is most likely to kick out a one state. So there's the measurement gate as we saw. The swap gate takes two qubits and swaps them. And there's the poly X gate, for example, which is something like the classical knot gate. It takes a qubit and rotates it 180 degrees about the axis where, imagine the axis, X axis pointing out of the screen a bit. And then there's a whole bunch of other gates bottom right there, the Hadamard gate, for example, the knot gate, that takes a qubit and flips it. So technically, you can do all the same computations that you can do with the classic gates. But this is a bit impractical. It's still hard to maintain the coherence of all the qubits. They need to be shielded from magnetic influence, enormously shielded. Uh, many things that will change the uh, state of those qubits. And that's the major uh, technical um, difficulty in the quantum computing world. But much, much progress has been made. The claim that decoherence is a fundamental problem, that error will always exceed the, what's called the fault tolerance threshold due to flipping of these gates improperly is fundamentally wrong. There's, in general, there's a lot of ways and progress has, has, that have been made to make these things as reliable as the uh, good old transistor. So why can a quantum computer be more powerful? This is where we will visit computational complexity, that is, computational power. And we're going to go back to quantum basics for a bit, and then stitch together some intuitions to see how a more than classically powerful algorithm works, namely Shor's factoring algorithm. So here we begin talking about computational complexity. So we can see how quantum computers affect the picture of computation. We'll be taking this from Scott Aronson in his book, Quantum Computing Since Democritus, Scott being a computer scientist 
expert in complexity theory and quantum theory. So P is a fundamental class of problems solvable by a Turing machine. And we're taking this in the context of the Turing machine being the embodiment of the definition of computation. They're solvable in polynomial time. P for polynomial. Hold on polynomial in this definition for a second, polynomial time. Focus on what a problem is in this case. It's a decision problem where the inputs are n-bit strings, or n-bit strings might be equations or something else, and the outputs are either yes or no. So what's polynomial time? Well, firstly, there's linear time complexity. Suppose we have n data items, and we can process them in 10 seconds. We double the data items to n. The time now is 20 seconds to process. We increase them to 8, 8n, the time is 80 seconds. So the time is going linearly as a function of n, the growth of n. Quadratic time complexity. Again, our n items in c seconds, we'll say 10 seconds, double to n. The time quadruples 2 squared, or 4 c seconds. Kick them up by 8, 8n. Eight we go 8 squared, or 64 c seconds. Cubic time complexity, same n items in c seconds, 10 seconds, say. Double 2n. Now we go up 2 to the cube. So the doubling to, to the cube, 8 c seconds. We kick them up by 8, 8 items. We go 8 cube, the, the, the 8 fold increase to the cube, or 512 c seconds. This is all polynomial time complexity. That is, growth rates are limited by some fixed power of n, n squared for quadratic, n to the cube for cubic, n to the fifth for a quintic, all a function of n. As opposed to this, there's exponential growth. Again, we have our n items being processed in c seconds. We double 2n, but now the exponent goes on the time, c squared seconds. 3n, the exponent goes on the time, c cubed seconds. 7n, the exponent goes on the time, c seven seconds. c to the seventh. This is longer, slower, worse than polynomial complexity for any polynomial size. So that's polynomial time. There is also P space, the class of problems solvable in polynomial space. That is, we're talking about computer memory and the growth of computer memory to solve the problem. But unlimited time, time not a factor in this case. And then there's EXP, which is the class of problems solvable in exponential time. It takes exponential time to solve the problem, but it gets solved. P is contained in P space and P space in EXP, saying that EXP is the worst case, the most difficult, most processing intensive space, then P space, and then P. There's another class, NP, or non-deterministic polynomial, problems for which if the answer is yes, there's a polynomial size proof of the fact that you can check the answer in polynomial time. An example, I give you a 10,000 digit number, a hugely long number. I ask whether it has a divisor ending in three. This has got to take a long, long time. But if your graduate student finds it, that is a yes answer, you can easily check it. Now P is contained in NP, NP being the harder. If you can answer a question yourself, says Scott, then someone else can convince you that the answer is yes without even telling you anything. Well, because you already know the answer. So put it another way, NP is solvable in polynomial time, but it's harder to solve than a pedestrian P problem. But given the answer, it can be checked in polynomial time. Hence, NP is harder than the P's and includes, embraces the MP's, embraces the P. 
The question is, is P equal to NP? In other words, if you can recognize an answer efficiently, can you also find one efficiently? Or in a spatial metaphor, where P is included in NP, P being, shall we say, a easy subset of NP, easier to find than NP, um, we'd ultimately then have just P, that P's are just, NP's are just P's disguised. Or to put it equivalently, I think, NP's with their efficiently checkable proofs, as we know it now, are, are really pedestrian P's with neat algorithms for finding answers, always waiting, just not apparent due to our human density. So Scott says people like to describe this as probably the central unsolved question in computer science. He says, that's a comical understatement. P versus NP is one of the deepest questions that human beings have ever asked. One way to measure P versus NP's importance is this. If NP problems were feasible, then mathematical creativity could be automated. The ability to check a proof would entail the ability to find one. Every Apple II, every Commodore, would have the reasoning power of Archimedes or Gauss. Automate mathematical creativity. Hmm. Down the road, warning, I'm going to disagree. So why is proof that P not equal and P is so hard? We'll put it spatially that P is actually contained in NP, NP being the harder set. The physicist in us says these problems must be solved by brute force. Yet given a huge number and asking its factors, or given two DNA sequences and determining how many insertions and deletions are needed to transform one to the other, these are proven to have neat algorithms. The proof would require that one can delineate the class of really hard NPs to those that just look hard. So Scott says, is this all we can say? We have a bunch of NP problems and we found some have solutions, others not yet. It turns out that if we could show that one really hard problem has a polynomial time solution, we could say all the rest do. And he knows Cook, Carp, and Levine's proof of this. This is the upshot of the theory of NP-completeness. A problem is NP-complete if it is both in NP and NP-hard. These are the hardest problems in NP that single-handedly capture the difficulty of every other NP problem. A couple of NP-complete problems. Packing. Given a set of boxes, specify dimensions. Can you fit them in the trunk of your car? Secondly, the three color problem. Given a map, can you color every country red, green, or blue in such a way that no two neighboring countries are, countries are colored the same? If you look to the right with the map, you'll see there's been an attempt made, but Italy is uncolored. And why is that? Because Italy touches a blue country. So if you paint Italy blue, it touches a blue country. Paint it red, it um, still touches a red country. Paint it green, it still touches a green country. So it's a difficult problem. No proof it can be done. Another class is co-NP, or the complement of NP. That is, if a no answer can be checked in polynomial time, as opposed to a yes answer. So then there's the special complexity class of NP intersection co-NP. That is the class where either a yes or a no answer has an efficiently checkable proof. A factoring is in this intersection, NP intersection co-NP. And Aronson states that tons of folks think factoring is an NP complete problem. And thus Shor's algorithm means a compu quantum computer can solve all NP complete problems, which of course then means that insight can be programmed, is, is um, programmable. The, in other words, the whole creativity problem has been solved. But nope, not the case. 
it's in this intersection um, situation. So we have some background on complexity theory. And we've even just glimpsed where Shore is going to fit in this framework. We just need a certain quantum mechanics basics before we can look at Shore, this quantum algorithm in the quantum world, quantum computing. So Scott notes there are two ways to teach quantum mechanics, the historical approach. This seems to leave folks lost in the mystical pronouncements in the Copenhagen strictures that we can't understand why this complementarity, why certain things happen in the double slit. Scott even notes that he has physicists occasionally come to him and ask, for example, to explain Bell's inequality, which is basically a mathematical structure, not so much a physics structure. And I think we're going to see why. Because the second way is to drill in directly to the conceptual core. The conceptual core is a generalization of the laws of probability to allow minus signs in more generally complex numbers. It's an advancement in mathematics. It's just that the physicists did it first. They were forced there by their experimental results and thus beat the mathematicians to the draw. So the standard probability is based on what he calls the one norm. It obviously makes no sense to say there is a 20, minus 20% 20 probability of rain tomorrow. It's either zero or some positive number. More generally, if we think of an event with n possible outcomes, we can express these probabilities with a vector of, of real numbers. A vector there being p1, p2, p3 probabilities, or, or, or say 0 0.25, 0 0.50, 0 0.10, 0 0.15, where mathematically these probabilities better add to unity, that is to one. This is the one norm. So what is the probability theory based on a two norm like? Consider a single bit, zero or one. It can have the probability p of being zero and one minus p of being one. But if we switch to the two norm, we no longer want two numbers that sum to one as above. We want two numbers whose square is sum to one. In other words, we want a vector a, B, or A squared plus B squared equal one. And the set of all such vectors forms a circle. So if you cast your eyes to the right, what we have is essentially the unit circle, where the radius is set to one, and therefore X squared plus Y squared must always equal a one. So as that black radius goes around the circle, uh, the two vectors will contribute various proportions of X squaredness and Y, and y squaredness to the one, but always it'll equal one. So with respect to our bit, how do we get two such numbers that, such that the probabilities add up to one? So simple, as the picture already shows, but a squared equal the probability of a zero outcome and b squared the probability of a one outcome. So why not just forget a and b and describe the bit directly in terms of probabilities? The difference is how the vector AB changes when you apply an operation. The standard one norm flip bit flip operation looks like, well, right there. You have a matrix 0, 1, 1, 0, and uh, you have your two probabilities, P and 1 minus P, and doing a little matrix math there flips that vector, 1 minus P now being on top, P being on the bottom. This is the most general flip matrix in this, in this framework. But in the two norm, what is the most general matrix that maps one vector to another? It's called the unitary matrix or ortho orthogonal matrix if talking about real numbers as opposed to complex numbers. I'm not going to describe a unitary matrix here because you have to go into Hermitian matrices and uh, not that it's that difficult. I wasn't going to do orthogonal matrix, but I'll take a little example of it. Over on the right, I've got an orthogonal matrix A, 0, 1, 1, 0. If I take its transpose of this particular matrix, then I'm turning the rows into columns and then multiplying A times A transpose. And what I end up with is the identity matrix with ones down the diagonals and zero everywhere else. That's the identity matrix. 
And what that's saying is that I can fundamentally reverse A via its transpose, which is also its inverse, and therefore go right back to where things were, unchanged, identity. So an orthogonal matrix or a unitary matrix operation can be reversed. And this we're going to see is a fundamental feature of quantum mechanics due to its linearity and due to these matrices. There's another little uh, orthogonal matrix. It doesn't have to be ones and zeros. That matrix also will end up with a transpose that when multiplied by itself uh, ends up with the identity matrix. So this two norm bit is the qubit. It is represented in the Dirac ket notation where the vector AB becomes, well, as it shows there, A0, B, 0, the 1 state. And here A is the amplitude of outcome 0, and B is the amplitude of outcome 1. Now amplitude invokes waves, and that's precisely what it's intended to be, a probability wave, an actual waveform. And so, so when you have waves, you have interference, destructive interference, where the two waves cancel each other out, constructive interference, where they amplify each other. And so this will be a fundamental feature that's going to be operative in our quantum computer. So given a qubit, we can transform it by applying an E2 by 2 unitary matrix, U, as you're showing right below there. This takes a vector in the plane and rotates it by 45 degrees counterclockwise. And since we know this is a unitary matrix, then it has an inverse. And so we can apply the inverse and undo what we did. We can reverse things right back to identity, the null state, or null transformation, shall we say. Now in QM, all is linear. This is extremely important, and uh, Scott emphasizes this all the time. It's the linearity that allows, for example, quantum error correction, because things can be reversed. So a linear transformation, qualities thereof, all lines stay lines. That is, the lines stay straight. No curves are introduced and everything remains parallel. And secondly, the origin is fixed. So if we take to the right there our little vector pointing to the coordinate point 1, comma 2, 1 in the x direction, 2 up, up into the y dimension, then let's consider something important about this, namely the notion of the basis vectors. That vector is actually a scaled version, scaled up version of the two basis vectors, i hat and j hat, as shown in the picture there, i being the green, j being the red. So that particular vector pointing at the 3, 2 spot is scaled up. It's 3 times i and 2 times j, so it's scaling up of the basis vectors i and j as such, 3i, 2j. So introducing this here because the notion of a basis vector is run into continuously in quantum mechanics. Ultimately, we'll see mention that we're going to be dealing with the Fourier basis, which is still linear, but it's a different basis. And essentially, when you're transforming vectors, in reality, you're transforming the basis vectors and then scaling those basis vectors up to some new point. So for example, here is a, a typical matrix transformation of a vector, so, as I've just revealed. The matrix ABCD is going to be multiplied against the vector XY, where XY is 1 and, and 2, 1X and Y being 2, in the case to the right. And then the next term is something that three blue, one brown points out is just ignored in the education process because we go right to the 
far right terms, which are sort of the mechanical um, computation of that matrix multiplication. But in the middle, what, what we're seeing is the new the basis vector transformation A and C being applied to the to the x coordinate and then the scaling up of that new basis. Similarly, the y coordinate also being applied via the matrix, the new points of the basis vector then scaled up. So concretely, again, here's a little uh, matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0 applied to our vector 1 and 2 in our space. And then we're taking that essentially the matrix pointing where the new basis vectors are and scaling it up. One, one of course, is only going one, but the other is the other uh, point is being scaled up by two. And so we do a little math to the right, and we end up with minus two and one, which is the x and the y coordinate uh, as such. So we have our new vector minus two and minus one. But in reality, what we've done, looking up again at the i hat j hat, is transform the two basis vectors. This isn't quite the same transformation because the new vector, the new yellow vector at the top there was pointing at a different point originally. But as you can see, what we've done is transform the basis vectors and now scaled it up. So this is an essential feature, the basis in the QM. Now consider our zero state. If we apply a unitary matrix once to the state, we get one over the square root of two times zero plus one. It's like taking a coin and flipping it. But if we apply the same operation a second time, we get one, shown below. Intuitively, even though there are two paths that lead to the outcome zero, one of these paths is a positive amplitude, the other is a negative amplitude. As a result, the two paths destructively interfere with each other and cancel each other out. By contrast, for the one state, the two paths have a positive amplitude and therefore interfere constructively. So we're here now to the wave implications, amplitude implications, therefore interference constructively and destructively that I noted a couple slides ago. You don't see this interference in the classical world because the probabilities can't be negative. So for Scott, the can this cancellation of positive and negative amplitudes is the source of all quantum weirdness. And I would add also its effectiveness as we're going to see. So given our two norm, we have the choice of real or complex numbers for amplitudes and nature chose complex numbers. This means you can't just square an amplitude. You take the absolute value, then square. Now why? Why the complex? Well, consider this linear transformation. Again, this is a mere reversal of the plane. It's like a 2D flatland creature. There's our little flatland creature with this heart on one side, and now he's flipped to with the other heart being on the other side of his body. So we've flipped the flatland creature with this linear transformation. But can you apply half of a mirror transformation like that without leaving the plane? Nope. You'd have to go into, th into the third dimension. If we, you have to see the flatworm flipping right up on his side for a moment, which I, I can't show real effectively, but he would be vertical on his side and then flip over to the other side. He'd be parallel with the building for a second or with my up arrow. But what if you want every linear transformation to have a square root in the same number of dimensions? In that case, you have to allow for complex numbers. So for linearity, for quantum systems, evolve to other states by means of linear transformations. That is, we can add states or vectors. And Scott notes that Abraham and Lloyd showed that if QM were nonlinear, 
we could build a computer to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. Again, says Scott, this would allow us to automate insight. So if quantum computing and NP-complete NP problems, there's a popular notion, and that is quantum computers can solve NP-complete problems in a heartbeat by trying every possible solution in parallel, then instantly selecting the correct one. But obviously this is not the case, since we can't prove that P not equal NP. For generic unstructured search problems, the quantum computer gives us some speed over classical, a quadratic speed up, but nothing like the exponential speed up of Shor's factoring algorithm. The quadratic speed up is because quantum mechanics is based on the two norm. This involves, by the way, findings of Grover and Bennett et al. So let's see. Classically, if there are n solutions, only one of which is right, well then after one query, you have one over the n probability of having guessed the right solution. After two queries, you have two over the n probabilities. And after three queries, you have three over the n probability. Thus, we need roughly n queries to have a non-negligible probability that is close to one of having guessed the right solution. QM-wise, we get to apply transformations over vectors of amplitudes, which are square roots of probabilities. So after one query, then you have one of the square root of n amplitude. And after two queries, you have two over the square root of n amplitude. And after three queries, three over the square root of n. So after t queries, the amplitude is t over the square root of n of having guessed the right solution. And the probability is t over the square root of n squared, or roughly t squared over n. So the probability, probability will be close to 1 after only t is roughly the square root of n uh, queries, rather than classically above n queries. Now we have the square root of n queries. So again, this is why the, the quadratic speedup is because of quantum mechanics is based on the two norm rather than the one norm. So again, we're looking at a very interesting just set of mathematics that's being employed here. There's another class, BQP, or bounded error quantum polynomial time. Essentially, the class of problems efficiently is solvable if quantum mechanics is true. Bottom line, BQP is part of EXP, the problem solved in only exponential time. Anything you can do in quantum polynomial time, you can do in classical exponential time. It is a quantum computer provides at most an exponential advantage. Things the classical computer can do in exponential time, Qs can do in polynomial time. So quantum mechanics or quantum computers are more powerful than classical, and Shor is an example. Shor's factoring algorithm is a polynomial time procedure. But where does the power come from? How does it work? The problem that Schroer was attacking is find the prime numbers of hugely large, or from the prime factors of hugely large numbers. Example 15, simple case, that's easy. The factors are 5 and 3. But how about a nice long 28 digit or more number? Back to the simple case, 15, P and Q are the factors, where you know, again, 5 times 3 makes 15. Their prime factors. Now we know RSA encryption with a large enough positive integer m, the product of two primes p and q, it would take the world's fastest supercomputer billions of years to compute the two unknown factors p and q. How large is large enough? An m around 28 digits, just like the one we're showing up there, would, work, would do the job. So number three gives a procedure to find P or Q, and that's X to the A mod N. This is a function based on modulus math. 
and when x to the a over, over n is an integer, it, it thus has a period, r, because it repeats. And Shor's algorithm finds this period. Now there's a little math that shows why x to the a mod n gives a factor of big N, our, our big number, our large number. So let's just look at an example in the table to the right here. So our N will be 15 and our X will be two. So looking at the first column, A, our A column, that'll simply run from zero all the way down to 15. Second column is X to the A, given X is two, we're gonna be taking two to the A all the way down the rows on that column. Example, where uh, we have a to be a four in the, the first gray row, uh, x to the four to the fourth is 16, where a is five, then x being two, two to the five is 32. Um, two to the six, row six there, two to the, two to the six is 64, et cetera. So we grow by powers of um, by the power of a. Now the third column is x to the a mod n. And what's that? Well, that's our modulus arithmetic uh, column. So if, let's just pick the first gray row, row four for a, uh, x to the a is 16. And we divide by 16 by 15 or, or mod 15, we'll get a remainder of one. Taking the second row, uh, a5, 32x to the a, well, divide 32 by 15, we'll get 30, 2 times 15, remainder of 2. Uh, uh, row 6, 64, 64 divided by 15, we'll get a remainder of 4, uh, 128, x to the, x to the se seventh, uh, divided by 15, 15 times 8, 120, we're going to get a remainder of 8. And then our first pink row, 256 divided by 15, we're gonna get 255 with a remainder of one. Hence, we're starting to cycle again, and we'll cycle again right through one, two, four, and eight. So what we have is this period of four numbers, one, two, four, and eight. And then, of course, multiple repeating periods of those four numbers. And so our little r, the period will be four. Had we done x to the a mod 21, we would have had a period of six. That is, there would have been six of these remainders repeating. So for any such sequence, x to the first mod n, x to the second mod n, x to the third mod n, as we're showing in the table, the sequence will repeat with some period that evenly divides the product of the two factors, that is product P minus one, Q minus one. P and Q being our two factors. Example, where we have N equals 15 again, and our factors are P equals three and Q equals five. And so P minus one times Q minus one is two times four is eight. And indeed the period is four, which divides eight, eight divided by four. Had we had N equal 21, P equals three, Q equals seven, and therefore taking them P minus one, Q minus one, you have two times six equals 12. And indeed the period of a six, which divides 12, 12 divided by six. The point being that in such a sequence, we can learn a divisor of the product P minus one, Q minus one. In fact, over there on the right, bottom where you see x to the r over two minus one equals three. There's one of the little tricks that takes us to one of the actual factors. So given we can learn a divisor of p minus one, q minus one, and, and with a little playing around and some tricks, we can actually get p and q. So what's the catch? Well, the sequence eventually starts repeating the number of steps before it repeats could be almost as large as n itself. An n might have hundreds or thousands of digits. And this is why finding the period doesn't seem to lead to a fast classical factoring algorithm on a classical computer. 
but there is something called a quantum computer. So in the quantum world, we're going to create an enormous quantum superposition where all the numbers in our sequence. We're now trying to find the period of a sequence, which is a global property of all the numbers in the sequence taken together. This is done using a technique called exponentiation. There's going to be an example of it. This relies on a binary expansion of exponents and repeated squaring. It creates a superposition of x to the a mod n. So the repeated squaring and multiplication. We're taking the first ex exponent of, a, uh, of our binary number there. And if you notice, it's being expanded 1 times 2, the first position 1 times 2 to the third. Then we're taking the second one, 1 times 2 squared now, and the third position 0 times 2 to the first, and then the final position 1 times 2 to the zeroth. And we're ending up with a nice little uh, squaring on the right. This will go or be in one of the registers. In this case, register 2, we'll call it of our quantum computer. The memory registers of a quantum computer can be put in a superposition of many values, up to 2 to the n possible states of our, our quantum state, 0, 1. For example, with just 300 qubits in our computer, we can have 2 to the 300 states, which is, well, a big number. So this is part of the, the, the quantum power. Now, supposing we create such a superposition, how would we figure out the period? Period. The period is a function of a function, is the grist of Fourier analysis. And at the heart of Shor's Q computer, the heart of its circuit is a QFT gate. There. We have a unitary trans a Hadamard gate, a unitary transformation, a QFT gate, a measurement gate in this um, in this circuit. Here's the problem. The best exposition of Shor that I have seen where one could truly understand what is going on is Michael Losis' PDF. I'll put it in the link in the description. 740 pages of math where Shor's algorithm starts at page 640 and merely goes on for another 100 pages after that. We hit x to the a mod n on page 731. Right, as uh, Aronson would say. So here, we're just going for a glimpse of an intuition, of a glimpse, the components that one would need, kind of what we're going to see we don't understand, but what has to be put together. So what does Fourier analysis do? Well, take a look at the picture on the right. I'm taking this as a piece of exposition three, from three blue, one brown, and as very um, beautiful exposition of Fourier analysis. We have a wave we're starting out with that's developing at three beats per second or three cycles per second, top. And what we're going to do is basically wind that waveform around our little coordinate system with its circle just beneath it. Three blue and brown calls this the winding machine. So given we have this three cycle per second wave, we're going to imagine a rotating vector where at each point of time, the vector's length is proportional to the height of the wave. So if you look at the, the wave having developed to nearly two seconds there, and you see the vector, the white vector pointing upward, you see that on the little winding machine, the vector is the same size. If we had developed the wave a bit more to there, the, the point of the wave is a little bit lower and, and indeed the vector is the same size, a little lower. If we develop the wave a bit more, at that point the wave is a lower, lower yet and there's where the vector is. So in this case, the vector is, is moving slowly around that circle. It's taking two seconds of wave development to achieve a full rotation. So it's rotating at 0.50 cycles per second. We can imagine a different um, 
sampling or rotational speed, shall we say, in, in uh, the case shown here, uh, 0.55 cycles of a wave is equal to a full rotation, and so the vector is rotating much more quickly. And uh, in fact, rotating at 1.55 cycles per second. Now here we have one cycle of the wave equaling a full rotation. And so it's rotating the, the vector at actually three cycles per second. And this is a unique case because now we have the high values of the waves lo lo loaded, shall we say, to the uh, right of the center point and uh, the low values to the left. And we can conceive, as it were, of a center of mass of this figure that's been loaded and moved now more to the right. So imagine that we have two waves, a two hertz wave at the top, and it's two cycles per second, and a three hertz wave at the bottom, three cycles per second. And we want to uh, look at their composite. So the composite waveform is on top, which doesn't look much like either of those two waves. And we ask, well, how can we drag the original waveforms out of that composite form? And we can do so with the winding machine. So we put the composite waveform in the winding machine and we let it rotate and we're going to advance through uh, various speeds, shall we say. And initially we get kind of chaos and chaos and more chaos. And then at, at two cycles per second, we're going to get that a sudden, shall we say, resolution of the waveform. And you'll notice the center of mass now has suddenly shifted and we're getting the equivalence of a spike on that coordinate axis. And then if we advance a little farther at three cycles per second, again, we're going to get this sudden resolution and the center of mass has, has again moved to what we, we can consider a spike on that X coordinate center of mass axis. We're, so at, at points, everything lines up at two and three cycles per second. And if we keep on moving, um, again, we're just going to have more chaos beyond that. And roughly the center of mass stays the same now. So if we took each wave individually into our winding machine, we would get our center of mass and our, and our X spike at uh, two hertz per second and three hertz per second in our, in our winding machine, but it's equivalent to, to take them both and we'll get both forms out uh, by putting them both in simultaneously. Again, note the concept of, of in, in, in the indication of coefficients, both big and little, where my yellow arrow there is pointing to one of the big coefficients and the blue arrows are pointing to the little coefficients, the little wobblings of the center of mass of that figure along the way. So this is what 3 blue 1 brown calls an almost Fourier transform. It isn't the whole enchilada, and the, the Fourier formula there shows that what we do is we take the integral of minus infinity to plus infinity, that is we're summing this whole thing. You see the minus e to the minus i pi to pi, which, which is involving the cycling, circling of our winding machine. But we'll let three blue one brown take you through all that in his rather nice exposition. But this is a continuous transform. Our huge number we have to factor is a set of discrete digits. So our Fourier must go discrete. We need a discrete Fourier transform. Well, a Fourier series of a function that is super simple would be f of x equal x. Or, in other words, a pretty simple straight out linear function where every, for every value of x, x equals itself. I'm doing sort of the y coordinate there, but uh, you know, x of 1, y of 1 equals 1, x, 
x equal to y equal to simply for x equals x. When viewed as a periodic function, in other words, when we put this, we can put this through a periodic or a, a Fourier transform, and well, we see that as this, uh, as where x is moving from minus pi to pi. And of course, one can ask, well, this is kind of strange, but just as a practical consequence, uh, perhaps we wish to build a circuit to generate a signal like f of x equal x electronically in a signal generator, but and circuits have naturally have sinusoids that at their disposal, which are constructed by squeezing and stretching and amplifying the 60 hertz signal coming from an AC outlet in the wall. However, they don't have an f of x, uh, f of x equal x signal. So one must build it from sinusoids and the Fourier series provides the blueprint for the circuit. So the concept is interesting here of the spectrum for our function f of x equal x, our simple little function that we're mangling with a, a Fourier series. Here you, here you see the first 25 coefficients of the signs. That was something rather similar to what we saw with our, our um, wave Fourier analysis. Collectively, the Fourier coefficients, are, or their graph, is called the spectrum of, of the function. And it, it is possibly an infinite list or graph of the weights of the various frequencies contained in f, our little function. So take a domain of numbers, size n. We're getting quickly to our number situation. If the function repeats itself many times, then it has a period t, where t is much less than n. So in this case, we have a set of 128 numbers. That, that uh, matrix is actually, actually a, a large vector, just collapsed and stacked of, uh, of numbers. And you can see instantly that it, there's repetition in it. And in that, in that um, repetition, we have a period uh, where the period equals eight. There's eight different repetitions in this. You can, you can see it visually. And there's a frequency n over eight, or 128 equals 16. And so you see these spikes at the frequencies, periods of frequencies of, the, of, the, of this number. At, you see uh, the first spike at roughly 16, the next, the next spike at roughly 32. The next, uh, and then, then the next spike, the next spike at 64, okay, uh, just divisibles of 16. So again, a very pure vector akin to a, the pure basis functions of the continuous cases like the sine earlier. Here's a very pure one. Well, then all the non-zero amplitudes in the spectrum, that is the discrete Fourier transformation, are multiples of 16 too. 16, 32, 48, etc. So Shor's period finding algorithm seeks to find the period A of a periodic function f of k whose domain is a finite set of m integers, where typically m can be very large. If a discrete function is periodic, its spectrum in, in the discrete Fourier trans transform will have values that are mostly small or zero, except at domain points that are multiples of the frequency. In broad terms, this suggests querying the spectrum of our function f of x. Ascertain its fundamental frequency, that is the first non-zero spike, and from it get the period a equals m divided by m. Now, to query the frequency in the quantum world is to take a post-oracle measurement in the Fourier basis. So we're changing the basis to the Fourier basis. Measuring along a non-preferred basis means applying the operator that converts the preferred basis to the alternate basis. And for frequencies of periodic functions, this is the QFT gate, as we saw. So what we're going to have is a number A in one of the registers of our quantum computer or circuit here. So the input signal, namely A, is transformed through what's known as a Hadamard gate, and it's put into uh, the memory store or register 
such that its qubits are put into an equally weighted superposition of 0 and 1. Achieved by an energy pulse that's 50% that required to flip the state completely. And the Hadamard gate is doing, again, a quantum matrix transformation, where the, the matrix, as we're showing below there, uh, transforms the inputs, 0, 1, into an even superposition of 0 and 1, the Euro Hadamard gate. So that's our first register and the contents thereof in our quantum computer preparatory to shore. Then there's a second store, which we already saw, which is created using exponentiation, which is, which is creating a superposition of x to the a mod n. So two quantum memory stores or registers. These are entangled quantum systems. I presume everyone has an idea about quantum entanglement. Their individual wave functions have evolved from a single quantum state, so they can be viewed as a single system. Any change of the wave function in one register is reflected instantly in the other. So this is the kind of critical key in the Shor algorithm. Each register is in an entangled superposition wave function of all possible values of a and our x to the a mod n. We then measure the value of the second register. This collapses its wave function up to a value of x to the a mod n say the value k, which we'll look at the next slide, and collapses the entangled first register, which is not measured, into a superposition consistent with k in the second register. Probabilities other than multiples of r in the first register will tend to cancel each other. As I say, their vectors will align. The remaining signal will therefore peak at, at values of a a plus r, let's look, look in the first column, a0, a plus r, 4, a plus 2r, 8, a plus 3r, 12. So there we're getting these peak values like the spikes in the Fourier function we looked at with three, three blue and browns exposition, and where a is the lowest integer value such that x to the a mod n equal k. So if we look at the third column, x to the a mod n equal k, for example, take row with the 4 in it, row 4, uh, 4, 16, 16 mod 15, remainder 1. Next one, 256 mod 15, and again, the remainder will be 1. And uh, 4, 4096, again, if we looked at that original table we looked at, we'd see the remainder is 1. So this is the k. So Shor's algorithm is Fourier analyzing the first register to deduce r, the period of the modular exponential function. Since the superposition in the first register collapses on direct measurement, the algorithm has to be run a number of times before r emerges. If you know r, then from our little trick, x to the r over 2 minus 1, you can deduce p or q and x to the r over 2 minus 1 is equal to 3, one of the factors of 15. Then the, then the common factor can be computed classically via Euclid's algorithm. And so, voila, we found the prime factors. And we can break your encrypted password. So that's how Shor's algorithm works with a few hundred pages missing, but we've got a view. So let's take a short summary. What have we seen? Qubits. We've seen qubits where anything can serve as a qubit, as long as it's quantum, can be a one or a zero and be in superposition. Working on these qubits, a highly mathematical framework but based on the two norm, the amplitudes for probabilities, complex numbers, linear transformations, the physical dynamics is partially critical in that it's partial because anything can be a qubit, but definitely critical in that we need the quantum properties to do the collapses of the superpositions. It's still Turing computation, albeit in polynomial versus exponential time in some cases. With oracles, 
Saturnian's O machines at points. For example, the QFT gate with its collapse of the carefully prepared superposition. So O machine was a more broad form of computation, Turing and vision, that not necessarily Turing machines as visualized. So we definitely have an, o, an oracle working at the QFT gate. So Scott would say, right, we're all right. So let's relate this all to consciousness, perception, the brain. So we'll take up later in Scott's book on quantum computing. We've seen that he already discussed and analyzed in some detail Searle, the Chinese room, and a little bit on Penrose. So he takes up at this point and says, with respect to Penrose again, as we have seen before, quantum computers don't seem to be even able to solve the NP-complete problems in polynomial time. Penrose, by contrast, wants to, the brain to solve non-computable problems by exploiting hypothetical collapse effects from a yet-to-be-discovered quantum theory of gravity. He reviews Penrose's classification of theories of consciousness. A, consciousness is reducible to computation, that is, strong my eye, or Ray Kurzweil, for example. B, consciousness can be simulated by a computer, but couldn't produce real understanding. Searle, Chinese room, as Scott assigns it. C, consciousness can't even be simulated by a computer, but nevertheless has a scientific explanation, and that would be Penrose. And D, consciousness doesn't have a scientific explanation. That would be people like McGinn. He notes that in shadows, Penrose conceded that a mathematician could be simulated by a huge lookup table, but this would not be a proper simulation, quote unquote. In this, Scott notes, Penrose seems to have retreated from C to B, that is back to Searle type position. Consciousness can be simulated, but there wouldn't be real understanding. So Scott, suppose Penrose means one could use a lookup table to simulate Winston Churchill by storing every quip and counterquip such that he'd access the table, pick a phrase, and output it. But the question is whether such a program could be written in the observable universe, one dramatically shorter than the list of all possible conversations, which would be enormous. But now he says you've entered Scott's realm of computational complexity. How does Penrose know such a program does not exist? And he says, all you, ye who claim the intractability of finite problems, the way lieth the P versus NP beast, from whose two to the nth jaws no mortal hath yet escaped. But no, we do not have to go through this beast. Penrose does not understand his own argument for non-computational thought, at least the implications thereof. For example, the hexagons or hexagonal numbers stacking always to cubes or cubical numbers. It's not a matter of quantum gravity. He simply does not sufficiently consider time. He is stuck in the classic metaphysic. The device that is the brain is integrally embedded in an indivisibly transforming holographic field. It's a flow, a transformation in which there are no instants, no discrete instants as the classic metaphysic would, would see it. It's a flow with no just previous instant falling into non-existence, that is, into the past, which is the symbol of non-existence, such that that instant is lost. This indivisibility property of the field's transformation provides a primary memory supporting continuity, and this allows our perception of holes over transformations, be it butterflies floating by, be it rotating cubes, or be it successively stacking cubes into larger and larger cubes, an event, by the way, which was also always preserving a certain set of invariants as the stacking continues. If you remember, the stacking involved taking a hexagonal number, like seven, folding it into a cubical structure, stacking it over the previous cube, which in the first case is one, then the next number, hexagonal, 19, folding it into a three-sided cube and stacking it, 
again it makes a cube, 27, and then the next, 64, and on and on. A growing, ever larger growing cube, which one could envision happening very quickly with that cube growing. Now, implicitly or explicitly, the question being asked in this computation is this. Can we find a sum of successive hexagonal numbers that is not a cube? Is there a yes answer to that question? Is there an algorithm that will give us a yes answer? A computer applying its algorithm begins trying the successive additions of the hexagonal numbers. And it will be looking for a yes. And it will be look, looking for a thousand years and still not find a a yes. It'll look for 2,000 years and still not find a yes. There is no stopping this computation for the poor computer because the problem is not computable via the definition of an algorithm. Yet the answer to us is obvious because we can see the essence and the basis of Penrose visual proof as a transformation, as a whole transformation taking place before us in an indivisible time. So this is how the definition of computation started. Hilbert, in his 10th problem, was asking, given a set of Diophantine equations, is there an algorithm which will show whether that set is is uh, solvable, yes or no? And Turing, taking up this question, attempted to define precisely what an algorithm is such that we can get the question, yes or no? This equation set is uh, solvable or not? And so the Turing machine embodied this very definition. And hence, we come again to the halting problem which is the essence of the stacking problem, because it is a computation that will not halt. The algorithm will never halt and therefore can never decide the answer, yes or no. Therefore, we end up with the non-computable and therefore into Penrose's non-computational thought. So will we ever, as Scott says, automate insight? Well, it seems a question not so much of P versus NP as this very foundational question, again, of what's truly computable and what's not. And therefore, we see that the answer is simply going to be a simple no. We will never automate insight because given the nature of computation, which is the nat nature of perception and the very nature of time, which supports these types of dynamically transforming proofs, will never automate it. In Orc Or, we saw Stuart Hammerhoff's, Hammerhoff's quantum brain vision. The brain's microtubules support quantum computation. We have the equivalent of qubits and we have a series of coherent superposition states and collapses. Each collapse corresponds to a, a being of consciousness. So how does this relate to the brain as a quantum computer? Well, look at what is necessary, say with respect to Shore, just to get a bit extra. The answer is it really doesn't relate. Stuart really gets nothing out of quantum computing, and his intuition remains. You're, you're just dealing with symbol manipulation. You're not getting bings out of quantum computing. His model is purely attributive, attributing consciousness to each collapse of a coherent state of qubits in the brain. Does Shor's algorithm or the quantum computer executed become conscious when the superposition is, is collapsed by the QFT gate? Doubtful. This would be, again, merely mere attribution. So what have we seen? Well, the same problem. The operative dynamics are still abstract. We still have the classic metaphysic. 
We still have abstract space, abstract time. We just have a more complex mathematics, the two norm versus the one norm. We're not even close to the requirements. Operative dynamics embedded integrally within an indivisible transformation of the holographic field. A dynamics reflective of engaged with the invariance laws defining events uh, and, and imposing a scale of time on the specification of the field or specifying continuous transformations or change and more as we've seen. So what does Scott say about quantum computers versus the brain? Firstly, the real problems to which quantum computers are believed to offer dramatic speedups, factoring images, integers, simulating quark gluon plasmas, approximating Jones polynomials, etc., just don't seem like the sorts of things that would have increased Og the caveman's reproductive success. Even if humans could benefit from quantum speedups, I don't see any evidence they are actually doing so. It said Gauss could immediately factor large numbers in his head. But if so, that only proves Gauss's brain was a quantum computer, not that anyone else is. Obviously, he's being a little loose here because this is no proof Gauss was a quantum computer either. Then he says the brain is a hot, wet environment, and it's hard to understand how long-range coherence could be maintained there. With today's understanding of quantum error correction due to the quantum mechanics linearity, this is no longer a knockdown argument, but it's still an extremely strong one. And I would say, but given the nature of quantum computation, which is still Turing class itself, the coherence problem is actually irrelevant. Finally, even if we suppose the brain is a quantum computer, it doesn't get us anywhere in explaining consciousness. So true. So recently, I saw or watched a 2014 World Science Festival panel discussion on YouTube titled Architects of the Mind, a Blueprint for the Human Brain. The context was the then new projects to map the human brain and emulate it. The panel consisted of two neuroscientists, two computer scientists, one of the computer scientists being Murray Shanahan, who was a chief mover in the brain emulation project. The neuroscientists described the unbelievable scope of complexity they were seeing. The dark space in the neuron pictures, for example, they're all glial cells. So we have the nice white neurons there in the picture, but the black in the spaces is all glial cells. Trillions, all with communication slash neuron modulation function we have yet to understand at all, but it's clearly being understood to be there. Doug Fields, one of the neuroscientists, said flatly, the brain is not a computer. Shanahan was unfazed. He talked unperturbed on how the brain would be emulated, emulated that is computer simulated, and, and also with much worry about terminator issues, etc. Douglas Fields expressed an extreme worry without some sort of guiding theory, a concept of what the brain is actually doing, and a computer is not it, there's no chance of making sense out of the mass of data, connections, etc. Kristen Harris, another neuroscientist, said we need the physicists, engineers, neuroscientists, all working together. In other words, get all the other disciplines working together to solve this massive problem of interpreting the data. We hearken back to part one of this series. This is the privileged problem, the origin of the image of the external world. Without an answer, we have no clue what the brain is actually doing. With it, we have a start. The engineers, the physicists, in my opinion, will not help. Where we have a philosophical problem that is a profound metaphysical problem where the new metaphysic demands leads to a new physics and a new understanding of computation. So Mr. Rat demands the last word here, in a majestic word, shall we say, to where we must go. So down the road, still way more on Berkson versus current memory research, temple consciousness, discussion of Chalmers, holographic principle in physics, time travel, QM's origin, something else 
We'll see. So next we'll see. Until then, signing off.